politically incorrect guide series about Islam and the Crusades. And for more, go to conservativebookclub.com. From the 2009 Key West Literary Seminar, author and critic Gore Vidal discusses his writing life in a conversation with the audience. This event is an hour and a half. Uh, well, welcome tonight to uh, this John Malcolm Brennan Memorial Lecture at the Key West Literary Seminar. And I want to thank very much Miles Frieden and the staff of the seminar for inviting us. Uh, so far, we've had a marvelous week of discussing historical novels, fact and fiction, the relationship of fiction to history. And it seems appropriate in such a context to have with us one of the premier historical novelists of our time and political commentators and essayists and playwright and so forth, Gore Vidal. Um, Gore has been uh, a major figure on the, the American literary scene now for many decades, ever since his uh, novel of World War II called Willowa appeared when he was a mere babe of about 20 years old. Uh, he's been at it strong ever since with 25 novels and countless books of essays, screenplays, uh, plays for Broadway such as Visit to a Small Planet, The Best Man, and um, he's also been a, a political commentator of incredible importance, I believe, to this nation, especially during these very dark years we've just experienced under the regime of George W. Bush, I've certainly myself looked to Mr. Vidal as a beacon, a lighthouse. And so um, he's also, I'll say, he's been a friend of mine for a long time, uh, like him very much, dear man. And so it's with great pleasure that I welcome to Key West Mr. Gore Vidal. Gore, let, there was some trouble with my microphone. Let's make sure you're being heard. I can shout. <laughs> Mr. Gore Vidal has rarely had trouble being heard. His voice goes above the masses. Um, we, well, Gore, we're at a seminar on um, the subject of history and fiction. And uh, as far as I can think, hardly any other novelist in our time has approached history more meticulously, more assiduously, more aggressively than you have. I know you want famously, I don't mean to steal your jokes, but you famously called this the United States of Amnesia. And uh, I'd forgotten that. You'd forgotten that. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember you once saying to me that you were trying to teach this nation something. Uh, could you, uh, do, would you say, address this business a little bit of of the United States of amnesia, our lack of historical understanding, and what's gone wrong, and how, as a novelist, you've, you've been able to respond to this crisis? Well, we have the worst educational system of any major government on Earth. Mm -hmm. And until you have better teachers, better textbooks, until you take the country seriously, mm -hmm. I don't know that there's much to be done about it. Every, every politician says, oh, I want to be known as the education president, even the one about to go home. <laughs> and uh, the only education we ever got out of him, you know, was don't do that again. <laughs> he was a, that was a cautionary tale. There's a wonderful book, by the way, I'm reading called uh, uh, Family of Secrets by, what's his name again? I, oh gosh, what is that guy? Russ Baker. Baker. Russ Baker. Russ Baker. Uh, not the one we knew not, from the New York Times. Not the famous Russell one. Baker, but uh, the, the infamous Russell. He spent Russ many Baker. years on it, and it's a family, forgive me, Bushes and Bushettes, but a family of criminals. Mm -hmm. And why they're not all in jail, I don't know. <laughs> and I have just been, if I seem a little dazed, I've been reading about their crimes and proposed crimes. And, how they got away with it, because the press is venal, easily bought in one way or another. And to see what they're doing, 
I mean, I've just been reading this section on the weapons of mass destruction and invading. Karl Rove, an advisor to this marvelous president, Karl Rove uh, really said, you know, it's pretty clear that you can get anything you want done as president if you can start a war. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, you start a war. And so Junior did. And here we are. You'd have to say, Gore, that you anticipate this whole scenario very much in your series of novels about American empire. In the Chronicles of Empire, uh, which is a series of seven novels, um, reaching back from, to colonial times and taking uh, the panorama of American history up to, say, even the year 2000, um, we see again and again a collusion going on here between the press and the government. Well, it's not been a happy experience for us, the people, but uh, no, it's uh, strange things went wrong. And, you know, the, the Constitution does have flaws in it. Mm. And I hear, you know, I, what I think are rather intelligent commentators, they couldn't figure out why we had the Electoral College. They couldn't figure out all kinds of things, why you had to be born in the United States. I thought anybody who knew any American history knew that that was put into the Constitution to keep Alexander Hamilton from becoming president because he was born in the Caribbean <laughs> and everybody hated him in government. <laughs> and I thought, now that's a basic thing, part of our history. And when nobody cares about it, and then suddenly, and I think in one week, we lost uh, a lot of habeas corpus. We lost uh, oh, the thing that happened at Runnymede, Magna Carta, which was the last president England ever left us mm -hmm. as they were heading to the east and out of here. And that was an extraordinary thing to have lost that. And that is one of the building blocks of our system. And I sit in this, you know, I think of, I was brought up in Washington, D.C., in the house of a professional politician, senator. And uh, we had a magnificent president then, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And that was a great man, hated by the Bush family, particularly going all the way back to Prescott Bush, an obscure uh, member of the Senate from Connecticut. They all hated Roosevelt because he was a communist. And he was going to do this, and he liked black people. And he was going to destroy everything. These, these people did a lot of damage, and I could, just, I could hear the voice of the right wing then every time the senator from Arizona saw fit to uh, bestow his wisdom upon us in the campaign. And he was making the case that Obama wants to become president so he can tax all the poor people in the country. <laughs> What's he going to do with the money? You know, I mean, what are they going to live on? Five minutes after Obama would be out of the shot, as they say, there we would hear. There would be a spokesman for the senator from Arizona. He's going to tax and tax and spend and spend. That was 1936. Mm. I remember that campaign. It was Alfred M. Landon trying to defeat Roosevelt, which he failed to do. They are still at the same old watering hole. Mm. Can uh, we talk, talk uh, a little bit? Somebody once said, everything on earth changes except the avant-garde theater. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Gore, I think a lot of people here are interested in the subject of historical fiction and, and the use of the past as a kind of mirror, well, say, reflection of the present and a mirror of the future, as Eric Foner said earlier today. And I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on how you came to write the American Chronicles and, and, and your, in a sense, to give us your view of history from a novelist viewpoint, how you how you well, worked? I was brought up in the engine room, you know, which is the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I acted, my grandfather was blind from the age of 10, and I would used to lead him on the floor of the Senate. And I'd find a seat for myself, easier then than now. And uh, 
I was about to say this. There's a funny story about Roosevelt. When he was not very mechanically minded, and he had to use one of these chairs for his entire five terms. Didn't he get elected to six terms? <laughs> Seven. <laughs> and, uh, he got stuck. Uh, the chair wouldn't work, and he was trying to get from his office into the cabinet room, and uh, just, everything broke down. So there's no Secret Service. They'd all gone to Dallas for the weekend. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, get me out of here. And so they, they couldn't find it. There were no, no stewards around the White House who could, would, would dare move him. He was like the emperor. So he said, the Navy Department is right next door, and you send for one of those sailors and have him push me out. He trusted the Navy. I don't think he trusted anybody else in Washington. And he said, the kid came over from the Navy and started to push the president across his office into his secretary's office, he wasn't there, and into the cabinet room. And it was the red shoes all over again. The sailor couldn't stop. And he was shaking with nerves. The president was beginning to shake, too. And later he said, you know, of course, I thought of assassination. Presidents do, you know. And as he was being taken on this long trip across the entire White House with a kid shaking behind him, and the kid is out of control, no secret service, nobody's around. Everybody's in Dallas. And he said, the boy, just the sailor, just saw an open door and drove him into a closet. <laughs> and here is the Emperor of the West, just sitting there, surrounded by carbon paper, which is how we defended <laughs> ourselves in those days. And he said, Afterwards, everybody is congratulating everyone on how cool everybody had been about this. But he said, you know, I suspected assassination. Presidents do, you know. And then I realized, now that I'm here in this closet, <laughs> that I am the first president ever to be filed. <laughs> <laughs> nice sense yeah, yeah. of humor, that man. <laughs> The other man, the present one, just feels all he has to do is show his face and we'll laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite true. I, I was used to love it when we, Reagan was the president, Gore used to say, he always read his speeches with a real sense of discovery. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> and he always read his speeches looking at the floor, which is where his dialogue would be in Westerns. Mm -hmm. You don't want somebody holding a script, you know, mm -hmm. at exciting moments when the mm -hmm. gangsters have moved on to the ranch. Mm -hmm. So he's always looking down to see what the next words were, and he looks surprised at times. In, in case you haven't guessed, Gore is one of the greatest impersonators of presidents ever to come down the pike. He does a great Reagan. His Nixon is unparalleled. Um, you, he wrote a play, as you know, called An Evening with Richard Nixon. Did, were you ever tempted to write a novel about Nixon? Well, I found with a play, An Evening with Richard Nixon, I discovered nobody wanted to spend one. <laughs> 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 I misgaged the marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier in the day, there was a, fo a, a picture of Lincoln up there, and I seem to have put another face in. But, um... Could you say something about, I, I always have loved your novel, Lincoln. I mean, you take Lincoln from his inauguration day right up to the assassination. And uh, we're now coming on the 200th anniversary of his birth. I wonder, have you, have you been thinking, have your thoughts on Lincoln shifted over the years? No, I, I like thinking about him mm -hmm. and uh, contrasting him to the horrible time we've been going through, which, which I don't think he would have believed that could have happened like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of new books about him. The best has always been David uh, Herbert Donnell, who used to be the head of uh, American history at Harvard. And he was the best Lincoln scholar of my time, and I borrowed from him quite freely. 
as Doris Stern borrows from me. <laughs> Wasn't that a brilliant notion that he put all of his rivals in the White House? I wrote a huge book all about that. And Doris just took it, you know, it just seemed, it was, she was like a magpie. <laughs> So flattery, flattery when it comes, you must accept, no matter the bearer's thought. Uh, you know, Gore, you've moved in an, to me, a very interesting way between writing novels, which are fiction, and books which really are, are history. I don't know if the audience is familiar with your book, Inventing a Nation, but um, a, a few years back, Gore published this, a uh, really astonishing collection of essays about how our constitution was created by this group of enlightenment intellectuals uh, sitting in Philadelphia in 1787 at the Philadelphia Convention. And you 1789. Some, 1789. And you did, sorry, <laughs> see the, my, the teacher. <laughs> he is our teacher. But you found a wonderful quotation there from Benjamin Franklin, which I had never seen before. Yeah, he was very negative about the Constitution. He, he didn't work on it, but he, he was a distinguished American, and they wanted him to be there at Constitution Hall. So as he was leaving the hall, an old lady friend of his was sitting out in the vestibule, and she said, well, Ben, what have you come up with? He said, well, we've got a republic, if we can keep it. Then he was, he was told the people running the convention, the last thing they wanted was Benjamin Franklin telling the truth, even in the vestibule of the building. And so they had four kids, young college guys, I think, follow him around to make sure he didn't talk too much, to say how much he disliked this Constitution. And one of the kids is leading him out of the hall I said, why are you so negative about it, or whatever phrase he would have used then about our handiwork here in Philadelphia? Well, he said, every constitution in the history of mankind, of a nation like ours, featuring representative government, every one of them has failed. Why should I think this is going to be the great exception? Well, the boys wanted to know, well, why had it failed? And Franklin, everybody thought he was senile. He was tough as nails. And he said, well, he said, you know, it's a curious thing, but what has defeated every attempt at making a good template, I'm sure he didn't use that word, for a constitution of a country like this, has not worked. Well, why is that? I mean, is it wrongly put together? And they, they were quizzing him. He said, no, it fails because of the corruption of the people. And that meant all of us. He made he had no favorites among us. He thought we weren't up to it, and we couldn't sustain it. Hmm. When I saw Magna Carta go, uh, you know, a year or two ago, and nobody, nobody, no, not a peep, not even Senator Byrd of West Virginia, who can be counted on to have read the Constitution within living memory, not even he said anything. Mm. That we were losing it as quickly as that. And then we saw what happened to the judiciary. One lousy judge after another was appointed so they would keep Bush's friends out of jail. And, uh, you know, as the great man from Tennessee said, you know, to the victor belongs the spoils. And that was how Andrew Jackson made his contribution at long distance. No, it was, uh, it's been a sad history. And what is really sad, with, we have no media that we can trust. Mm -hmm. Anybody can buy it. Mm -hmm. So how people are to be informed, I don't know. I read the foreign papers. If I really want to find out politically what's going here, I'll read a British paper. 
But one thing you certainly suggest in the Chronicles of Empire is this is not a new thing. The media essentially working for the administration, promoting their wars, um, putting for you know, getting behind, getting the people behind their corrupt policies. Well, they can't think of anything else to do, I suppose. So they <laughs> they support power. They you, love power. Do you still support the idea, which you've I, I know in the past you certainly did, of having another and having a new constitutional convention? Well, Thomas Jefferson thought we should have a constitutional convention every 30 years, once a generation. Mm -hmm. I think that's a bit often, but uh, you could do it every now and then, certainly. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things break down, and a lot of bad practices become habit. Mm -hmm. and that's what a lot of it is, just bad practices. Nobody set out to destroy it. Well, can, can we recover? I know you have a wonderful essay recently on the shredding of the Bill of Rights and what's been done under the Bush administration. And, and this is a genuine question here. Can something be done to restore American liberty, American freedoms? Well, I, I have sent a note to the president-elect, and I said, you know, you, d you talk too little about the future and goals of your administration. The restoration of the Constitution of the United States should be number one on your list, because mm -hmm. that's where we are naked. Mm -hmm. And I hope it will fall on fertile ground. Mm -hmm. Now, can you, can you talk a little bit about um, your ambitions for your Chronicles of Empire now? You've got the seven novels, and uh, where, where do you stand with that? Did you wrap it all up, do you think, for all time with the Golden Age? Well, I was trying to, but I didn't, so I'll have another go at it. Well, I suddenly realized that the most important period that I had skipped, the uh, Mexican War. Mm. And I don't know, I've always hated it. So that's no reason not to write about something, but uh, <laughs> I thought that was dumb on my part to just let it slip by. And so many lies have been told. I think it was what this administration really did that no one else had ever done on such a scale was to make lying the national pastime. You lie about everything. And the public just sits there, well, they all do it, you know. Well, we all say, good morning, you're looking so well when the other person is near death, but uh, that's called good manners. Lying to get something like an election is dangerous in a republic. And that's what Mr. Franklin meant when he talked about the corruption of the people. The, the people are too little grounded, they're too little educated. You can't tell them anything, they don't want to know anything. I used to be a working politician in upstate New York, and uh, I used to go around to parent-teacher groups and so on, and I had one question when I felt things were getting too dull. I said, you know, I get around a bit, and I've never met a stupid six-year-old. But I've never met an interesting 16-year-old. Now, what is, am I seeing the wrong people? <laughs> or could you tell me what it is you've done to him with our educational system? <laughs> They're proud to know nothing. They're proud to, you know, ignorance is, is a bliss far better than anything of a chemical nature. Bliss is achievable. Can something, do you think, really be done in the American schools to improve the teaching of history in a way that people won't be so gullible, so susceptible to the corruptions of the media. Well, where would you find the teachers? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to have people who are pretty well-rounded and who know a lot. I heard that Eric Foner today was asked a question by a journalist and uh, who had come away with this message. Mr. Foner is one of this country's few great historians, contemporary historians. And phoners, they said, well, I just heard you say, Professor, that 
history is up for grabs, thinking that anybody can write anything and get away with it. Well, the phone was not saying that. And he said, when was it first up for grabs? And Foner said, well, you better read Thucydides. <laughs> Last thing a journalist ever wants to read, you know. You may remember one thing from the past. I was inspired to say at the election of Mr. Bush uh, to the first magistracy of the world, I said, mark my words, he will end his office as the most hated president in our history. Mm -hmm. It came to pass. I'm not going to do any more tea leaves for you. I'm not going to tell you what the market's going to do next. Mm -hmm. I don't go in for that kind of black magic. It, it, it was stunning to see him get away for a little brief while with the Iraq war. I mean, that would take some, some doing. Well, you, you can't declare on war. Well, I guess you can declare war on a country and nobody knows where it is. And people were very puzzled why we were over there fighting. I spent three years in World War II in the Pacific. And it was, I remember thinking in 1945 when the Germans folded and the Japanese folded, I remember thinking, well, you know, this is going to be nice. We've done that. We don't have to do that again. You told me then I'd be watching newspapers about Baghdad falling. I would have said, you're crazy. And you wish ill of the United States, if you like that sort of thing. But people complain about the lack of patriotism. Well, patriotism depends upon having an identifiable country that you know something about. It's not just, you know, stars and stripes and uh, things in the lapel. I'm wearing a French decoration tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I may it's, have to On his birthday, it. Mr. Vidal I'm was made a commandant of the... Order the, of, of... the order of something or other. Something or other. <laughs> in France, though. It's good a French something or other. You're, yeah. We should call you commandant, Vidal. Commandant. I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you something about your work in Roman history. I've always loved your novel, Julian. And I wonder if you could talk just, uh, before we open this up to the audience, and I'm hoping there'll be a lot of questions for you in a moment, uh, could you say a little something about how you came to write that book? Which one? Julian. Oh. I don't like monotheism. It was a much better world, the Greek and Roman world, which was polyverse when it came to gods. It was also the world of philosophy, which is even better. It was, it was thoughts, systems, ethics. I thought the world was a better place in the third, fourth, fifth centuries. When monoth monotheism grabbed us by the throat, only one God, only one king, only one factory, only one wage for all. Wow, the damage that was done from that moment on is still with us. And out of that came all the wars. There can only be one leader of the world. There can only be one religion. In the English Civil War of the 17th century, both sides, the Roundheads and the Cavaliers, went into battle. I'm sure many of you have ancestors, as I do, who were in that war. They went into battle shouting, kill for Jesus. It's a great Christian thought, isn't it? <laughs> and you went to Rome to research, Julian, is that it? I went to Rome to research it, and then I started researching everything inside. And uh, my final work in that field was something called creation. One man, had he lived to be 75, could have known Socrates, the Buddha, uh, Confucius, Zoroast. Unlikely, but he could have. Covers the right periods. So I invented such a character. Very happy with him, too. And it's kind of interesting. It's a crash course in comparative religion, which is 
I think rather useful now that mm -hmm. we're the greatest nation the world has ever seen. Just look around. People flock from all over to, to live here, to enjoy our educational and medical <laughs> prowess. Aren't we lucky? Well, I wonder if we can, um, I, I'm sure we have a, a crowd of people here who have lots of questions for Mr. Vidal. And we've got microphones, people with microphones on both sides, left and right. So let's, if we can, begin with the questions. Uh, make sure to keep your question pithy, clear, and uh, witty. <laughs> I am your great, uh, one of your great admirers, Thank uh, you. one that you would not like, because I, I'm a conservative Republican who never voted for Bush. Well, I, I can't understand. Well, I like you for that. <laughs> well, that, I, that I think you're really great. But what Thank I you. can't understand in reading your essays is how you can fail to see that the enormities, the constitutional, unconstitutional enormities committed by Lincoln and Roosevelt are even grosser than those of Bush, and how you can feel that Roosevelt was a great man when he was one of the critical persons in creating the You drive. sound like a Republican back from 1936. <laughs> we passed all that. We moved on. He gave us a world empire. He is our Augustus. I don't feel in any need for an Augustus. I thought we were better off without one. The right wing, to which I assume you pledge allegiance, the right wing uh, quite likes the empire, as long as we're on top of the world, racially, religiously, and the mess we've made. Well, Gore is pretty fierce about Roosevelt, by the way, in the Golden Age. Um, he's got some very interesting ideas in there about how Roosevelt uh, really um, brought on or, or anticipated Well, he go to Japan into attacking us at Pearl Harbor. That is quite true. It was known to everybody in the services in those days. And I had a cousin of my grandfather who was uh, admiral of the fleet, the fleet at Pearl Harbor, which Roosevelt had ordered to Pearl Harbor instead of letting it go back for a winter berthing in uh, San Diego. And that's how we lost that fleet. No, I, but there are a lot of things wrong with him. But he got us out of a depression, didn't he? He made the country matter in the world, which it did not before, and it does not matter now. Interesting. Now, well, let's move on to another question. Um, <laughs> bef before war breaks out in this room, <laughs> I, I, I sense a rumbling. Right over here, was there one? Hi, Gore. Um, since we're in Key West, I was hoping you could speak about your friendship with Tennessee Williams. And in particular, I believe I read that you were working on an unfinished play of his that he was working on when he died. Could you speak about that? Yeah, well, his estate asked me would I uh, prepare for, um, you know, for uh, Broadway. Uh, his last play, which is in quite good shape, it's a fascinating play, a bit like Camino Real. And I was looking forward to doing it, but we had something like 100 producers, all of them lawyers working for the estate. Not extraordinary. And uh, they've been no use, so it, it may never get done because the little money people get in there and they grab piece after piece. And I wish the meal. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about Tennessee? Um, say something about him Lil here in Key West? The Glorious Bird is what I called him because uh, he always had a town called Glorious Something in one of his plays and then the image of the bird is all over his writing. And I remember uh, Chance was the guy's name and the character's name. And he talked a lot about being a bird without flight which is a normal human condition. No means of access to the skies or to aerial navigation. He was marvelous at metaphor, Mr. Williams, and uh, we didn't deserve him. I mean, he was by far our best playwright. But he was a true original, and 
Every play, novel, short story that he wrote, Time magazine attacked it. They had Louis Cronenberger was the critic there, and Cronenberger was a sassy little thing. And Cronenberger said, uh, his mind is a fetid swamp. <laughs> then they got a new critic at time who uh, admired Tennessee and gave him several very good reviews, so he, at least he died knowing that he had been appreciated by that lousy magazine. <laughs> and he was uh, kind of funny about it because I said, you know, I'm going to quote. Uh, you had to warn him, Tennessee always suspected that you were up to no good. He was totally paranoid. He had been attacked all his life by the press for no good reasons except they felt like doing it. So I did a piece going through every bad review he had got. He didn't like that. But I was writing in the other direction, particularly Time Magazine. The Feated Swamp has struck again, and they had a wonderful cover on uh, Esquire, where I published this. It showed Tennessee coming out of a swamp, mud trickling down his face, seaweed, He's, and he's holding his typewriter. He's just barely got out of the ooze. And the caption was, from Ecclesiastes, I can't help my religious bent. My great-grandfather was a Methodist bishop. In time, all things shall come to pass. <laughs> I, and oh, they were furious over time. And the bird was happy. He said, yes, I see what you mean. Uh, <laughs> But did you have to quote so many bad reviews? Well, I said, yeah, come on, how are they going to get the point of what we're talking about? Well, he said, still suspecting a plot. You know, we're all out to get him. Was, wasn't it with Tennessee that you went to visit André Gide? In mm, no, I, we went to visit Santiana I see. Uh, at the mm -hmm. Convent of the Blue Nuns in Rome, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and the bird behaved himself, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's have, an, there was another question. I saw a hand up over here. Can't see very much with the lights. I see hands going up. Here we are, right here. Um, I was rather struck in Empire of, uh, by your depiction of Teddy Roosevelt, with the high voice and the clattering teeth. And I'm wondering if it was informed by any reminiscences of your family. Well, I knew his daughter, Alice, extremely well. And she had teeth like tombstones, you know. <laughs> but oh, she had a tongue like a razor. I mean, when Alice was in a room, people, you'd be the last to leave because you knew you would be the subject of her next text. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a, an artist around uh, Washington called Bill Walton, who was very much in favor with the Kennedys. And he's a charming guy. But she would say things like, Bill Walton was leaving a party a bit early and said, I don't know what became of Bill Walton, she said in a voice that, you know, you could have heard all the way to Silver Spring. Uh, he settled for just being like me, a local, what word she use? Just a, a local thing. You know, meaning Washington, D.C., he never, he never left. And she thought that was tragic. And said, now go here with this magnificent novel that he has written, and she got the title wrong, uh, about, um, it's not Julian, what's the other one that begins with the J? And uh, he got out, and he saved himself. We're happy to see him come back. And Bill is just always here. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was kindly, it was kindly meant, but mm -hmm. don't think it played very well. Another question we have. There's a hand up over there somewhere. Uh, yeah, there's a, is there a, is there a microphone in the balcony right there? Yes, there is. Oh, good. 
There she goes. All right. My first dislike of Theodore Roosevelt came to me from my grandmother, Mrs. Gore, who looked after the blind senator. And she had been taking a walk, and the Gores lived in Rock Creek Park, right by the Ford. And she was talk, taking a walk with a, another lady friend down by the creek, or the branch, as we also called it. And she was uh, suddenly out of the woods of Rock Creek comes this crashing sound. It's Theodore Roosevelt astride a horse. And he's heading straight for them. And he said, stand aside, women. I am the president. <laughs> she never forgave that. He <laughs> dared call them women. They were ladies. OK, the question up there. Yeah, OK. Um, you, you talked a lot about government. What do you think about Madoff and the economy? Well, he's a great hero, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> Just do a riff on him. A lot of dreadful people were caught. I think probably a lot of nice people were caught by him. But Mort Zuckerman, you know, he sort of deserved to be caught by somebody like Madoff. <laughs> <laughs> um, you see, the first thing you do if you don't like Franklin Roosevelt, you must say that he's destroyed capitalism because he's all these rules and regulations you can't poison the people the way every decent country can they don't want to be regulated they don't want us to have uh, non-toxic shrimp <laughs> they know what they're doing and the congress has been so supine for the last few years, the Congress doesn't care about it either. So we have really an unregulated country, and you can't have an unregulated modern country. Diseases, they spread too rapidly. And the dream of the Bushites was to reverse everything Franklin Roosevelt had done. First, they understood nothing about economics. I mean, he was a Keynesian economist, and he saved our system, for which he was called a traitor to his class. Well, his class was so much higher than that of his uh, critics, I think he never paid any attention to what they had to say. But he was, uh, he saved the whole show. And we're going to need, I mean, Obama is going to have to show the same kind of agility as my father was director of air commerce for Roosevelt for four years, and he said he didn't like him much. My father was a Republican from South Dakota. But he said, you know, you can't help but admire the president, because when something goes wrong, he'd say, Brother Vidal, let's try something else. And he did. And law of averages, he won. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, let's have another question. I think yes, right uh, there. Mr. Fidel, do you see any parallels with to, has happened today with Gibbon's assertion that uh, the Roman Empire failed due to their incursion in the Middle East? No. <laughs> They'd been everywhere anyway. They were running the, the whole world. Palestine was, uh, and the kingdom of Judea, these were all properties of the emperor at Rome. They took that for granted. Was it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, history has not yet judged. It certainly made Greek the international language, and that was the language of intelligence, out of which comes our New Testament, not to mention most of our great literature from the past. So I think we should be grateful for the Romans for spreading Greek all over. But you've been talking to me the last few days, Gore, about um, the threat of terrorism. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, there was no threat. I mean, there were warnings about 9-11, but the idiots in office now 
paid no attention. They were warned. Everybody, the Russians warned us, Japanese warned us. Everybody knew we were going to have a mishap uh, during that period of time. But the Bush people were so happy with themselves, and they were stealing money right and left. And that's what they were in office for. And they were getting rid of regulations. Because old Prescott Bush, grandfather of the incumbent, still incumbent, I guess he is president, old Prescott Bush was one of those moss-backed Republican senators who didn't understand anything that was not, you know, kind of in kindergarten talk. These people are stupid. <laughs> now, you also, in your essay on 9-11 and the Bush response to 9-11, you talk a lot about blood for oil and how it's not uh, for nothing that so many of the people connected with the Bush administration were, in fact, oil company executives. Well, you know, like stays with like. Mm -hmm. You've got to read this book. It's absolutely wonderful. The uh, family of, what's it called again? Family of, what did I say? Family, family of, of secrets. secrets, yes. It's because I did my own title for a family of liars. <laughs> they lie about everything. Even when it's inconvenient, they tell a lie. No, it's a fascinating amount of work, and you won't believe what they got away with. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to Prescott Bush, who was dealing with the Nazis, I can remember that, when he was still in the Senate from Connecticut. And he got a warning from President Roosevelt, who used two words, treason. And the other one was even darker. And Prescott Bush vanished into the bush for a time. They feel that they have no allegiance to anything but their own money. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is bad to have them, people like that, in public office. There was another question here in the middle. Could we bring the microphone to the center? There we go. Yes, Mr. Gore. I read today that the uh, GOP's number one enemy in the future is going to be Al Franken, uh, who may be the next senator from Minnesota. Do you think there's a place in the Senate for a comedian? Well, they've got a hundred now. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, I'm not an Al Franken fan. I mean, he's a comedian who never made anybody laugh. He's a writer who never wrote anything worth reading, but just went around talking about how he's going to be elected to the Senate from Minnesota. And he, he got that. I'll hand it to him. But I don't see him being very useful. Minnesota, to me, means La Follette. That was the, absolutely the most stimulating place in America. What? I don't think, could you not hear that? I said Minnesota to me means La Follette. Progressives, the Farm Labor Coalition. It's a serious state. Oh, I know it's on the verge of socialism. God, I'm so terrified. <laughs> There's a question right here, sir, with the blue shirt. You find it in your heart to miss Norman Mailer. I was very fond of Norman Mailer. <laughs> I can't say I was terribly fond of his writing, but um, no, no, we were friends for a hundred years, it seems. I was published first in 46, and I think he was published first in 48. So we're that close as contemporaries. There's a nice picture, if you like pictures, in, uh, of Mailer, Vonnegut, and me, in Vanity Fair. I, there's a good journalist there called Walcott, James Walcott. And uh, the war was heating up, and he, Walcott was looking around for the, the great voices of American literature to speak against the war in the Middle East and so on. And finally he came and says, the only three voices from literature that we've heard are Vonnegut, Mailer, and Vidal, three octogenarians who served, actually, in the war. 
the Second World War. So get the picture. You'll get the picture. <laughs> mm. uh, Mr. Gore, what do you think of uh, Sarah Palin and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Caroline Kennedy? Well, Miss Palin, um, that horrible speech of hers, I'm going to tell you, you know, you got to know. Uh, she is, I could, t I knew that there was some, something came to mind reading her quoted dialogue. It's so quaint, it's the way she thinks lower class Americans speak. Well, they all sound like Oxford graduates to me compared to how she sounds. <laughs> and she, she's got everything wrong. Every time she says, we Americans, I'm ready to kill. And I suppose she's good for fun and frolic. I don't know. Good for Saturday Night Live, anyway, right? Well, she, she brought them to life, you yeah. <laughs> know. <laughs> so she did have some useful, edifying purpose. But I don't see how but anyone's serious. She could just serious. think she could have been the successor to Aaron Burr and Dick Cheney. Well, well, well. <laughs> I can hardly wait. <laughs> but Carolyn Kennedy, what are, what are your real thoughts there? You've had a long association with the Kennedy family. Well, the last time I saw her, she sat on my lap. <laughs> and she was about it could, it five could happen years, again. She, Be she careful. was about five years old. And she had a puppy dog on a leash, and I was in the upstairs sitting room with Jack and Jackie, and she, Jack had promised to take her swimming down in the basement. So she came up to collect with the, with the dog. And he said, no, I can't do it now. Uh, she was very, very angry and bawled him out. Dog didn't look too happy either. <laughs> That's the last time I saw her. I cannot speak with any great knowledge her, of her uh, soul. To, you won't address her future career as possible senator from New York? Well, considering what we've got in there, I don't think she's going to pull the average down greatly. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, another hand up over there somewhere. Question. Here we go. It's in the middle right here. Someone with a, white, a, a woman with a white jacket. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was more about Amelia Earhart and Nancy Love and some of the people your father was in touch with in his leadership uh, in aviation. Yes. But would you tell us more about some of these folks? Well, Amelia was, I wanted my father to marry her, and she wanted to marry him. And I said, well, why, years later, I said, why didn't you marry her? He'd got rid of my mother, which was all anybody was interested in. And there she was, and Amelia was, she was wonderful. She didn't like football any more than I did, but he would take us off to the Army-Navy game up at West Point. And she was a good poet, and she would have a handbag filled with poems that she had written. So she and I would be reading uh, her poetry as the game unfolded. <laughs> this is not the one they play with a stick. And uh, I was the mascot of the Army team of 1925. They lost. <laughs> uh, Amelia was, she was not a great flyer. This was a problem. <laughs> well, Lind Lindbergh, you know, had a kind of nasty sense of humor. And he didn't like competition, particularly from this golden girl from the West. He would always announce, after she'd done a flight somewhere, the word is, Amelia, made a good landing. <laughs> Shaking his head with wonder at this, you know. What happened to her, everybody went, they're making a movie about her now with an actress called, what's she called? She has a name. 
and a blonde woman. Look, looks not unlike her. But she's going to play Amelia. Uh, my father's theory, because he was in charge of the search, so Pre President Roosevelt just put him in charge, because he had left his job as director of air commerce, and uh, he took over the Pacific search for Amelia, and there was no sign of her. Well, all the nonsense that she was a spy for the United States, it was all this nonsense, it was tabloid stuff. What she was, was uh, fed up. She hated her marriage to George Palmer Putnam, the publisher, and she wanted to get out of it, and he arranged two huge personal tours after she came back from this flight. And she thought this was a bit too much, and she was having a premature change of life and she was not feeling in the jolliest mood about the world. And my father thought she just, she'd killed herself. I said, what about Noonan? That was her navigator. He said, well, Amelia was perfectly capable of hitting him on the head with one of his own bottles. <laughs> she would have killed him before she crashed the plane. <laughs> and my father, she's just, I remember the last conversation I had with her, we were coming back from Garrison from West Point, where we'd watch the Army-Navy game. And she had a map with her of the Pacific. And every, you know, this is one of those carriage cars with a thousand people were staring in the window just to see her. She was the most famous woman on earth. And they're obsessed with her. I was obsessed with the map. I wanted to see, you know, what was going on there. I was about 10 or 11. And I said, well, what part of the trip, you know, worries you the most? And I said, well, she said, people think it's the Pacific, but it isn't. It's uh, Africa. You get down in the jungles, nobody can ever find you again. There's no, there are no cities. There's no way of, of a search couldn't be organized. She'd thought that far about it. So if she did crash herself, and she, she did it feeling fairly safe about island hopping, that she could do it and uh, would be discovered by somebody. Or not, if she wanted to die. We had real people then, you know? Well, we, we have time, I think, for just one more brief question, and lots of hands were up. So in the middle, right there, let's end with, yes, you, right in the middle. Yes, we go. If we can bring the microphone right to the center there, and this will have to be the final question because we're at the end of our time. I'm curious, um, since Obama is inheriting such a mess, what, what you think his priorities should be? Restoration of the Constitution. And he should be very specific about what we've lost that he would bring back. Because we have no assurance from him that things just won't stay the same. It's, all, it's easy to let things slip and slide. So, so anyway, he's got a royal mess with the economy. I mean, I remember the Depression very clearly, and I see some gray heads out there, and they remember it too. And it, was, it wasn't fun. I also remember the Bonus Army marching on Washington, and they were encamped out at uh, Anacostia Flats. And my father and I used to go swimming, every, uh, swimming. We used to go uh, every weekend, we'd go flying. And we always went over the Anacostia Flats because I was fascinated by the boners, that's what they were called. And I thought they were skeletons. You know, I thought it was perpetual Halloween out there in Anacostia. But it wasn't. There was a lot of poor people who would come to town for a bonus for the World War I. One of the great things that Roosevelt did, now that I'm on the subject, uh, Jimmy, who was in his oldest son, who was in the Marine Corps, came back from the South Pacific and held forth a table. And Mrs. Roosevelt told me the conversation. It went like this. He said, you know, Pa, you've complained about how the soldiers were thrown on the ash heap. 
after the First World War, after the Civil War? Is that going to happen again? And Ms. Roosevelt said, you know, Jimmy made a lot of sense. And my Franklin was somewhat disturbed. And he said, well, we're going to try not to. We'll try to see that they have work. And then he went into a riff about the GI Bill of Rights, which he was about to sign. And that changed the United States totally. We had an intelligent, civilized population, the majority of which, for the first time. That is a revolution, and a very great one. And it took a rather great soul to inflict that on a country dedicated to its worst vices. Well, on that note, our worst vices. <laughs> Thank you very much to Mr. Gore Vidal. This event was part of the 2009 Key West